Hello there and welcome back to the Closet Historian and back to my sewing room for another project. And it is another very Halloween project today and you do still have me with my more ghastly voice. So perhaps it's on theme, although I would rather have wished I didn't get ill this month because I had a lot of work to do and specifically quite a lot of work to do on this design. Because I have had the idea for this dress brewing in my mind for quite a while now. I had some orange taffeta in my stash that I bought for a different project years ago and then didn't end up making that project and so I just had this weird orange polyester taffeta kind of floating in my stash and I thought what the heck am I going to use this for until I saw this fabric on Etsy. This is a spiderweb mesh with black sequins on it and uh, I don't normally buy fabrics all the way from China although I assume that's where a lot of fabric is made no matter where I'm buying it from but I thought you know I'm gonna wait for this bunny to come all the way across the ocean because it's worth it to have really nice spiderweb mesh and this fabric is quite a good quality and I will link the shop where I found it below because I know some of you out there also would like some spiderweb mesh in your life and who can blame you? So with my orange and black iridescent taffeta and spiderweb mesh in hand I had to come up with a design worthy of such an epic spiderweb lace and I decided to take inspiration from several 1940s and 50s dresses kind of the pointed collars and strange uh, little extra flangy little bits inspired me to incorporate a larger collar and sort of bat wing inspired shapes on my dress here is my sketch and I am going to use my side swing skirt that I made recently here so I put a card up to that because uh, you will need that pattern if you want to copy my dress from today and the top of this dress is actually simple enough it's the skirt that gets a little bit confusing I may need to pull out another one of my little paper models to show you exactly what's happening because it was hard to even figure out how to video it when I was making it and I was also making it in the height of uh, like trying to get back to work while I was still sick so who knows what sort of frame of mind I was in while I was filming this. I don't really, I haven't looked at the footage yet, but I am worried that I might have to have some splaining to do. It was a lot to get this dress together while I wasn't even at 100%. But in the end, I hope you will agree that it was definitely worth it. Let's go ahead and jump on over to the blue patterning table of doom and get started. So here I begin with my sketch, set that to the side and I'll bring it up here for you. And my bodice block, here's a tracing of my regular bodice block here. I'm just adding a half inch of seam allowance down the center front here because I will have a center front seam. So I'm going to do a giant collar on this buddy which will flare off of a v-neckline. So I'm going to draw in my v-neckline here. I do draw my necklines just trying to keep in mind where my apex is because I like to have my necklines uh, at least like two to three inches above like the apex level basically. That's just kind of how I gauge how low something is. Of course um, like right between the bust is like right here at apex level um, where I'm going to be drawing a line here because I'm drawing three lines from my apex into the center up here at the top because I'm going to move these two darts in to that uh, center front. This is the same way I moved the dart fullness for gathering as in my uh, summer batik dress this last summer. So I'll put a card up to that video here if you'd like to see how to do this uh, as a strappy dress instead of a sleeved dress. But let me just go ahead and cut that out and I will cut down my dart legs up to the apex here for both my side dart and waist dart and then I'm going to move those into darts or rather just move that dart fullness into my center front seam here. So let me go ahead and uh, fill this buddy in. So I'm going to close that side dart, tape that shut like so and the same with the waist dart here opening that dart fullness up into my center front here. We can move it anywhere from the apex as as you know if you've been watching me for a while here check out my darts video here on the channel for more uh, of an explanation on what's going on here with the darts but same amount of dart fullness just in a new spot. I will shave off a little bit of this seam allowance here. Um, it's better to have a little bit less than a little bit too much when it comes to gathering here. That's just my opinion. Um, I'm going to cut off my excess like so. Get rid of that, smooth this side seam, and we are ready to go. So Halloween dress front. Sketch my grain line on here in case I got confused. And then instead of doing a facing or anything, I'm going to do a large bat-ish shaped collar. So I've just got a piece of paper that I've lined up with my v-neckline underneath to trace on the shape of the collar I would like. I'm going to have it meet here in the center. I actually wish I had made it thicker where it meets here at the center front um, after seam allowance and everything because I'm drawing the seam allowance on here so I know exactly how wide my collar will be. Um, after seam allowance cutting away from that width at the center front I actually wish I had made it a tiny bit wider down there but that's all right hindsight as usual coming into play when I do these voiceovers because I have to watch myself and know what I would change but this will get gathered down this is going to be my collar on the front here I will make a collar for the back as well and actually tape them together so you'll see that later 
actually really like the shape of this, so I'm going to add seam allowance to this because, of course, if I use it as is, it will end up a half inch smaller. So here I am adding seam allowance to the bottom of my collar pattern here, like so. This is just like a flat collar. Uh, it's similar to a sailor collar. It's just instead of doing a sailor collar shape, it's just whatever shape you want. So you can draw on any shape. You can have it be scalloped in the other direction. Of course, I'm having my bat wing like reverse scallops here. And this will gather down, same on the other side, and that is our front. For the back, I do just have a tracing of my bodice block back, and then I've just narrowed the shoulder uh, to match up with the neckline of the front. So this is just scooped here, like so. And I'm going to go ahead and draw a collar for the back of this as well. So I'm tracing that shoulder seam on, the back neckline to give me an idea. And then I'm just going to draw whatever shape I want. That's right. Honestly, I could have made this back collar a little bit bigger. And the way I scoop this out at the back neckline, uh, I wish I would have done it more like I did the collar or like the um, flangey bits on the Mandragora bodice. So if you have seen that, then you know what I'm talking about. But let me just add on some seam allowance here to this shape. I do like a slightly Halloween bat inspired shaped collar or uh, accent in general. And these will not be the last of them for this dress because you can see on the side of the skirt in my sketch, I do have some little bat wings on the side of my hip here for this dress as well. And yes, if you were a pocket inclined person, you could make that detail into a pocket. But alas, we know I don't like pockets, so I will be incorporating no pockets on this dress. But it would be easy to slip a pocket into these uh, decorative bits on the skirt later if you'd like. I'm just gonna make sure I have my seam allowance for the shoulder drawn in here because I'm gonna layer the front and back collar closed. So here I'm gonna draw the seam allowance of the shoulder on the front piece and they can line up the seam allowance for these pieces and I can cut out the collar as one piece. So this is gonna get layered closed like this, seam allowance over seam allowance. And I can't see it, so let me just go over it. I'm la layering that seam allowance closed for the shoulder seam and taping it closed. Now it's a very weirdly shaped piece, uh, so it's kind of annoying to do it as one piece, but but this will get sewn on like this, and that's how I'm gonna finish my neckline today. Instead of having a facing or a full lining or anything, this dress will be interlined a little bit, but I'm not actually gonna put a lining in this dress. You'll see later. Here is my sleeve that I'm going to use today. I actually used that recently in a different video, so I will link to that video here where you can get that. And then I will use my pencil skirt pattern to make the underskirt for this dress, and I will use this pattern here to make the overskirt. And this, again, is from that side swing skirt I made recently here on the channel. The only modification I made to this is I scooped out the side where that hip uh, will be open. You'll see exactly what I mean later when you see the dress. And I will probably have to walk you through the way the skirt is layered at the waist seam because I have two skirts for this dress, an under skirt, like a lining skirt layer that is the pencil skirt, and then this larger swing skirt on top. Um, and the zipper goes into the pencil skirt and the dress. And then the other skirt is kind of like an overskirt, but instead of it being having a separate waistband, it is sewn into the dress, so I can't wear it without it, but I will go into that later. That's what I mean when I say this dress ends up being a little bit chaotic. I'll get into that later. But once I had that giant skirt piece cut out, I could cut everything out of my orange taffeta. Here I cut out the giant skirt piece and then used the rest to cut out the rest of my garment here. And of course, I cut everything out of my spiderweb embroidered and sequined net fabric as well here, and I'm going to go ahead and baste a lot of this together by hand. Here's my sleeve linings. Those I can just pin at the underarm. I will be lining my sleeves, if not the rest of the bodice, so I'll have that going on. But this, I'm just going to carefully layer the net fabric over the taffeta, and I will pin around the edges. Of course, you know, things move around when you're cutting them, um, and here I was thinking, this is really not lining up. Surely something's wrong. And it was! Shocking. So this is how you get turned around really quickly, and why I usually like to leave a pin in the front of my sleeves, so I know what the hecky doodle is happening. That's right. So I put a pin in the front of my sleeve here so that I will not get confused later. Ooh, seeing as I was just about to baste the sleeves wrong. But I'll pin the sides of this, line everything up properly this time, and then I can hand baste everything. Now I do have my backs here as well, and I will have to put these two layers together and then sew my darts in it. And I was just deciding which side is the outside of this. The outside has sequins, of course. And I'll grab my orange taffeta layer here, layer that in, and then I also have a cotton layer as well, just to add a little bit more stability and strength to my bodice, uh, because this will be like the tightest part of my garment. As we know, I don't add any ease to anything. Um, some people, I, I think, don't like having 
uh, clothing that like uh, pinches you in any way. I don't mind. And so my clothes have, if anything, a little bit of negative ease, my pattern currently at this point. So um, I just wanted to add a little bit more stability up here into the bodice because this taffeta is rather thin and this mesh is of course mesh. It's not too delicate of a mesh lace stuff. Luckily, it's kind of on the sturdier side for mesh. I've worked with worse, I should say. But I am layering up that cotton muslin layer, the black cotton muslin. Um, black muslin, by the way, I get at Mood Fabrics, if you're ever wondering where I get all my black muslin, because I do use it quite a lot here on the channel. And uh, I love a cotton muslin fabric, and even better if it comes in black. Um, so I'm just layering out the backs like that, all three layers, and now I'm doing the fronts here. All three layers, and I will just pin the sides. Um, you can see me like tapping and like, I don't know, running my fingers like over piano keys but over the fabric gently uh, sometimes and that's just to align layers or to align a grain line so you'll see me like tapping and patting the fabric sometimes. Something that I do that I forget to mention that it's hard to explain. It's a tactile thing but I'm just pinning my sides to make sure everything's aligned and then I can hand baste this all together with a long beading needle and some random yellow thread that I had laying around. So you can see the back here has all been based around the sides and I'm just going to trace my darts onto the back. The nice thing about having cotton in the back here as well is I have no shame about being a little rough on it because it's cotton compared to, you know, the fancier stuff on the outside. Now because there are so many layers here, I am going to make like I do for a Victorian costume and go ahead and baste these darts, uh, the interior of the darts together so that the layers don't move around when I go to sew the darts in a minute. So I'm just going to again grab my beading needle and my trusty yellow thread here that I thought was a good contrast. You can see what I'm doing on camera, but also is a bit of a Halloween touch inside my dress. <laughs> a little bit of a Frankenstein look, but I'm just gonna baste inside my darts before I pinch and pin those, before I can sew them. The sequins on this mesh are quite small, flat sequins, so I was not worried about sewing through them. If your machine is like very persnickety, maybe it can't handle it, but the 99K is a cast iron, you know, buddy with lots of horsepower and she's, She's gonna go so right through a sequin if she hits one, so I'm not worried about it. Um, if any of them like stick out weirdly in the end, I can always just cut those ones off. It's not a problem, uh, really, with this particular fabric. Uh, other sequin fabrics, I've never really worked with a heavily sequin fabric. Might be evil, no idea. Usually I'm sewing on my sequins myself at the end of something, so I've never actually worked with fabric that already had the sequins in place, nice. But I just wanted to show you how I do this basting. Um, it's really quick and a lot faster than like I think it is. Like in my head I built it up to be such a big deal like oh I have to hand baste this it's going to take ages but really only takes a little bit of extra time and it's so worth it to have my layers stick together for the process that I'm about to do to put this dress together. This dress would be a lot easier to make uh, in less layers but you know worth the extra hassle for this delicious mesh I think. I've never made a full um, like mesh and interlined garment like this before. I've made like a lace dress before, but not with an interlining. It was just completely transparent. So it was just the lace layer. This is the first time I've made something with a mesh layer on top of a um, like interlining, I suppose. And I'm just going to be treating these, you know, as one as soon as everything's basted together, sewing the darts and everything together all in one. Instead of doing the darts in each layer and then layering them up, just sew the dart through all three layers, treat them. Like basically I'm just treating this as an orange spiderweb fabric from now on. If this fabric came in colored background I would buy it. And over here on the 99 I'm gonna go ahead and start sewing those underarm seams of my little tiny sleeves here. You can see how short my sleeves are. These are basically just little cap sleeves although I don't like actual cap sleeves. Usually the cap sleeve is like fitted down to the shoulder and I like mine to like stick out like a uh, all-in-one sleeve does for a little bit of flare at the shoulder and I feel like it helps create an hourglass shape so I always stick to like a flared cap sleeve as opposed to a traditional like fitted cap sleeve. I really don't like fitted cap sleeves at all, actually. I'm just not a fan. I feel like they don't do anything good for my arms. Whereas this, a little bit of flare at the shoulder, the wider the shoulder, the smaller the waist, as I always say. But you can see I'm just sewing my darts here, as usual, starting at the large end of the dart using a small stitching length, stitching down my colored pencil line and then off the end, and then I will tie the point shut. And over here on the ironing board, I can go ahead and press open everything I just sewed. I'm even using my Taylor's clapper here as a way to press these little tiny underarm seams. You know, it works. And especially, this is all polyester that I'm working with today, except for the cotton inch lining. Um, so pressing it is no problem, but I do have to have my iron on the right setting <laughs> so I don't melt anything because, or melt any sequins, which luckily I did not have happen to me. So yes, this is another project made out of 
petroleum-based fabric. <clears throat> I do apologize. I've been using polyester a lot more this year just because I've been using a lot of fancy fabrics and fancy fabrics with like lurex or sequins, mesh, things like this. I mean, I, I can't even imagine if a mesh, a silk mesh like this were something that were available, which I've never seen something like this in silk, but I can't imagine how much it would cost. Um, and if I'm going to use polyester mesh, I might as well use polyester taffeta and polyester taffeta is what I had in my stash. You're, you're following along. But I usually stick with natural fibers, unless I'm using some specialty brocade, lurex, sparkle fabric. Um, usually I'm only going for, or like um, those like latex skirts I made, those like stretch skirts I made earlier in the year. So it's only for like special effects that can't be achieved in natural fibers that I turn to polyester usually. And my voice is so gravelly from being ill, I apologize. Here I'm just pinning my sleeves together. So I have my sleeve lining and my outer sleeve and I'm just pinning those together right sides together along the hem so I can hem these buddies. And then I will go ahead and press my darts here in my back pieces. Just pressing those darts towards the center back. I like to press my darts towards the center, either the back or the front, depending on what I'm working on. Some people prefer to uh, like cut open their darts and press them flat. Some people press them towards the side. You do you if it works, you know? All that matters is that you get a result that you're happy with. So if you do it differently, but you're happy with how it comes out, sounds good to me. I will go ahead and serge some of this. It's already hand basted together, but uh, again, I'm not going to be fully lining this. I'm just going to be treating this all as one fabric from now, now on, basically. And um, so I'm going to have raw edges inside my dress. And to prevent fraying, I'm just going to run that through the serger here at the waist and the side seam, like so. Back on the ironing board, I have my fronts here. You can see I've just surged the center front, waist, and side seam for now. I'm trying to think, do I want to surge the rest of this? Probably. Um, but I'm going to put my gathering stitching here in between these two pins where I had put those uh, dart, where I had put the dart fullness in my pattern. Um, so basically these pins are an inch out from where the dart fullness ends. And I'm just going to go ahead and put two lines of gathering stitching on either side of my front. The backs here are ready to go. I have this surged and I might actually serge these shoulder seams as well. Then I have my collar piece, which again, <laughs> is such a unique shape we have going on here. I cut out four of these in a black shantung that I've had kicking around the studio here. This is the same fabric that I made my bat back jacket out of last month, um, but I'm going to go ahead and use two layers of this. I didn't interface this because it's crispy enough on its own. I figured it would be fine. I could have interfaced it, honestly, but it was gonna get thick right at the neckline seam anyhow, so I didn't interface this. I think in the end, it looks fine. Um, but two layers of this. I actually sketched on the stitching line on here. I don't normally do that, but with this shape, there's just a lot going on. So I would rather follow an indication, a stitching line here. So I have that sketched on in colored pencil. You can hardly tell, but I'm just going to pin that together and I will stitch the outside edge and kind of like hem my collar. And over here on the machine, I'm just, again, hemming my sleeves. So I'm just going around there. I will actually put understitching in those sleeves too as well later. And then I will stitch on that stitching line for my collar. And I am just stitching the outside edge of this collar. So like the hem of the collar, uh, the inside neckline edge will be sewn to the neckline, um, each layer individually. I'll show you what I mean. Uh, it's basically the same way I put my collars on when I've been doing all my stand, little stand collars recently. This collar is just a lot bigger, but uh, just because the collar is a larger shape doesn't mean the process of stitching it to the neckline changes really. I just still, I still did it in the exact same way. So you'll see what I mean, but I'm just sewing around my curves, my little bat wing-ish flangy flangies. back on the ironing board. I'm going to pull these sleeves apart here so that I can have access to this area here and I will put under stitching in where this will be hemmed basically. Um, and this is a bit curvy so I will go ahead and clip this seam um, especially because I'm going to add that under stitching in which adds stability back in. So because this is slightly curved I will go ahead and trim that. Then I will do some under stitching on these. I'll show you that over on the machine. A very Halloween project here. Honestly I could have, you know, if I didn't have orange taffeta already waiting to be used I really would have liked to do this with like olive green or like chartreuse underneath. Even like yellow would be fun. Purple, red, blue, any color underneath this mesh I think I would like. Lilac would be pretty, you know. Maybe I just need to get more of this mesh and make something else with a different color underneath or a sheer dress that I can wear different colors of slip underneath. We shall see. It's not too expensive, this mesh, and it is delicious and wasn't too hard to work with. So I was pleasantly surprised how easy it was to work with because I was very afraid at 
first initially. But I am just clipping my curves and corners here on my collar pieces, and I've just grabbed a piece of random steel boning, and I'll grab a knitting needle, anything I can use to poke out my corners. I have to trim that corner down a little bit more, especially with these like very slim, like acute angled pointed corners. It's kind of annoying. If I can get away with it in life, I try and make my corners as close to 90 degrees as possible. I like a thinner corner, but it's just annoying to have to do this part of that process when you have a narrow triangly bit. So not the most fun ever to get this right, but it will take me ages here. So I'm going to speed this up to like 800 times speed and just try and get everything smooth and press it into place. Um, the only, you know, the only weird difficult thing about this collar is the extra shaping I did. So if you did like a normal shape of collar, then it wouldn't be nearly as difficult as this. I do think my voice is extra tired today for some reason. I mean, I was working on building, uh, doing some set work all day today. So it's not like I was talking much, but I am kind of, uh, exhausted. I have a lot to do. Um, I finished making a different sewing project today and working on the set project that I have going on for later in the week and you'll see the results of both of those soon. But uh, I do need to make a skirt tomorrow as well, and then I wanna get this video out for all of you. So a lot going on, and I'm still, you know, coughing a little and getting over some ickiness. Just in time for Halloween, hopefully. Even though Halloween is on a Monday this year, which is just unfortunate. But here I have my sleeve lined up. The seam allowance is underneath my left hand here, underneath the lining side of this. I'm just gonna stitch right next to where my original seam was about an eighth of an inch away using my presser foot as a guide for this to hold the seam allowance to the lining side. This just helps keep everything folded inside when you are eventually done with your garment. Um, often understitching is used on necklines or hem edges and you see me use it most often with uh, neckline facings but today I just wanted to throw some into my little short sleeves here. And because my sleeves stand up away from my shoulder a little bit um, I wanted to make sure to line them so that it would be nice and pretty in there if People were staring at the underside of my sleeve while I was moving my arms, which honestly, my arms are my biggest insecurity. Uh, I've gotten most of, over most of my self-esteem issues that really uh, were actually quite uh, severe when I was younger. In my early 20s, I wouldn't let anyone take pictures of me, and now I'm a YouTuber. So clearly I got over that, but my arms are still my one insecurity, although I may be doing something to improve that situation later in the week as well. Um, <clears throat> but... You will see what I mean in due course. And while I'm over here at the machine, I will sew my shoulder seams that you can see I did end up surging as well, front to back. I'm not gonna sew the side seams yet and I'll do the collar first and I'll show you why. I also haven't sewn the center front of my garment yet, you'll notice, so. All right, so I have a left and a right, basically. And my gathering stitching is already in here while this is flat, but I'm going to put the collar on next, which is kind of weird, but true. So I'm going to sew the underside of my collar to the outside edge of my bodice here. So hopefully you can see what's happening. Just taking the underside of the collar and letting the top side be free and sewing this down. And I will hand stitch the other side uh, over the seam allowance later. So I'm gonna stitch this on by itself, one layer at a time here. Um, again, very similar to how I do any collar. It's just a weird, large, bat-shaped one. And isn't this mesh fun? Oof. Very tempting to get some more. Hopefully it stays online for a while. Although we did just lose a fabric shop, didn't we? For all of those of you who shop online for fabric, you may have noticed that fabric.com is no more. Fabric.com was a good source for fabric and then Amazon bought it. And then it was a more of a guilty source for fabric, but they still had nice apparel fabric, so. Mm. But now Amazon have shuttered fabric.com and now there's a quote unquote Amazon fabric shop that I found exceedingly hard to navigate and immediately clicked away from after after clicking over there from fabric.com after they redirected me I was like uh nope and I noped right out of there so I don't know if the stock is the same on Amazon that they used to have on fabric.com but it's not user friendly and um so basically I just lost one of my fabric sources or it wasn't just me a lot of us lost our fabric source so that's a that's a big bummer I am just clipping my curves and then I'm going to press my seam allowance into the interior of the collar and then I will fold the other collar edge under that half inch and kind of sandwich everything together. Again, like I do my stand collars. So I'll pin all of that so it's ready to go. I'll do the other side as well and I will hand slip stitch that entire edge. And I will do the other side the same exact way. And then we can finally sew the side seams and the center front here. Funny enough for this bodice, I sewed the center front last, which usually I feel like is one of my first steps 
but not for this particular dress. So once that is all hand slip stitched shut to the interlining basically, that is the nice thing about having interlining layers is you can stitch right into them and nothing gets seen on the outside which is nice. I will go ahead and stitch my side seam. You can get an idea of how I was ironing all this into submission after hand stitching it here over the tailor's ham using a lot of steam even though this is polyester. Steaming it into shape honestly which you can do like you know when uh, cosplayers use like sort of plastic materials that they can shape with heat? Same idea honestly. Um, just much thinner material, fabric, as opposed to moldable plastic. I've never actually made any armor or, like, cosplay uh, pieces. Maybe one day I will play with that shapeable stuff. I could go for, like, a metal corset thing. As I said, I don't mind stiff, tight clothing, so I wouldn't mind. But let me just stitch my side seams, press those open, and then we can get started on this center front. I am going to measure how much, how long my center front normally should be. Um, so this, before I moved the dart fullness into the center front, it was nine and a half. So I need to gather this down to be nine and a half. So I'm gonna put pins nine and a half inches apart on my uh, ironing board here. So I can have a guideline for how much I need to gather this down. And I will just space out my gathers. I'm gonna tie them off on one side, as you often see me do, like so. Just bring all the threads to the top and then tie them off. And then I'll pull these two gathering threads down on this side. Again, just largest stitch length on your machine and two parallel lines of stitches within the seam allowance to, you, to do gathering. Um, that's how I do gathering, at least. You can gather by hand if you want. You can use a gathering foot if you want. Many different options. Once again, whatever gives you the result you're after is the right choice. But I will do the second side here the same exact way, <clears throat> just tying these off and gathering this down. And then I can pin the two layers, well, <laughs> it's actually six layers of fabric between the mesh, the taffeta, and the cotton interlining. It's six layers of fabric down this center, which is why I didn't bother interfacing the collar because there's a tiny little bit of the collar up there at the top that gets sewn together. Like that's enough, you know, <laughs> to have all those layers going together. That's why I say that this, tiny tiny bit on the right hand side of the collar. I kind of wish I had made it wider right there because it is kind of irritating. But I will go ahead and pin my center front together. Again, just being careful with my gathers, kind of spacing those out and using extra pins in that area to make sure everything is evenly distributed. And then I can sew this together, half inch seam allowance, as usual, over on the machine. go ahead and press that seam open like so. Make sure my collar is behaving. And now this is quite close to the neckline edge, this seam allowance. So I'm actually going to cover this with some double fold bias tape that was sitting here because I had a piece just like randomly sitting here. I thought, you know, I could use this and fell it down to the interlining to make this a little bit more comfortable along the center front. I know some people have uh, like sensory issues with fabrics uh, being a weird texture against their skin. This is not something I ever think about really. Um, luckily, I don't have any uh, such sensitivity, but because there are actually scratchy sequins on this, <laughs> it is a little bit more of a concern. I probably will wear this over a slip or some sort of an undershirt thing anyway, so that I don't have to wash this dress all the time. I'd rather wash an undershirt than the dress. And I have some slim little undershirts to wear under things like this now, but um, I'm just gonna cover this center front seam in particular, just because it's right near that point of that V-neck and I really want to make sure that everything stays in place up there by my neckline. So I will just fell this down to the interlining and the outside will look like this, alas, and the inside looks like this. So if you're looking closely inside my dress, which why would you be, honestly? Maintain some decorum. Um, and I could do this to the side seams as well. Or of course you could just fully line a dress like this. But this is what I decided to do in my slightly cough medicine induced, you know, process. And it was at this point, now that I had the rest of the bodice together, that I could go ahead and set in my sleeves. I am going to just set in the 
um, outside layer of this, we have the lining that I understitched. That's hanging free on the inside of the garment here. I'm not stitching that down into the arm side here. I will use that to line this later. I have done this a couple times here on the channel. Um, I'm not sure if it's been as obvious as this will eventually look because normally I'm using the same fashion fabric and lining, like I'm using my fashion fabric as my lining. So I'll be like doing this with a rayon dress and you cannot tell what's going on. So actually today we might be able to get a better idea of this, hopefully. <clears throat> not because I'm narrating well, but because hopefully you can see what's happening in a minute here. Oof. But I will just wrangle this all through the machine over here on the 99K. Every once in a while I do miss, you know how on a regular machine you can like take off part of the machine? You know how on like a modern machine you can usually like take off part of the front of the machine so you can like sew around a sleeve or things like that? Every once in a while I do miss that I don't have the adaptability here with the 99, but it's worth it because she sews over my pins without complaint. Once again, this is a curve, so I'm going to go ahead and clip this seam because it will be encased. I'm not worried about it um, being clipped. So here I'm turning the sleeve lining back. I'm going to, just like I did the collar, fold this under a half inch and cover up all my seam allowance, like push all the seam allowance into the interior of the sleeve here. If this had stuffing in it, it would be a pillow. <laughs> Same idea. Um, but I'm clipping my curves both on the lining layer and on the arm side bodice layer. And I'm going to just fold this under and I will pin it right over my stitching line with that seam allowance, with that seam allowance sandwiched in between all these layers. And then I will again, either you can fell or slip stitch this down to the inter lining. And then at least my sleeve will be finished very cleanly, even if I didn't line the rest of this garment. And we have a nice contrast between the orange and the black so you can actually see what's going on for once. Okay, so now that I have the entire bodice constructed, it's time to start thinking about the skirt. And again, I used my pencil skirt pattern. I actually folded this so that it was about, I don't know, six inches shorter than usual because the skirt isn't going to show ex anywhere except for the side of my hip. <laughs> One of the hips will be free, but the rest of this is gonna be hidden. This is here as a structural layer that I'm going to put the zipper into. So my center back zipper is going to go down the bodice and down this pencil skirt, but not in the overskirt layer. The overskirt layer is going to be sewn into the um, like waist seam of the dress for half of it and then the back half will be free and then just hooks closed. So you'll see that. I might do a little illustration for you to really walk you through this one because it is kind of a strange idea, but I thought, how am I gonna put a center back zipper in to my dress for this? Because the bodice needs to have a, I'm not, I didn't wanna put a side zipper in the bodice and my side sweep skirt has a side zipper. So how am I gonna combine these two things where the zipper is one of the items has a zipper in the back one has a zipper in the side, and I just decided to make the dress with this little lining skirt inside and then have the rest of it be an overskirt that hooks. It's more of like a couture way of doing it, not because of like my fine finishing, but just in the like expectation uh, of having a like slightly half hidden zipper. Sometimes in couture, there's like a corset underneath the dress and then it zips closed on top of that. There's several different closures, or we're talking about historic fashion, there'll be like a lace up, back and then it's covered with another layer that's hook and eyed closed or snapped closed. So there's different layers of closures to achieve a certain, you know, desired effect in the end. And so for this garment, I decided to <laughs> make my life difficult and put the zipper down the center back of the skirt lining and bodice and then have an overskirt that hangs free over that. Hopefully this will make sense in the end. And these are my skirt flanges. I just drafted these the same way I did the collar. Um, off of my skirt. I just drew little shapes that I wanted. It was not, you know, you can draw whatever you want. It's one of those things where I just like imagined a shape and drew it. So it's not like something I can really walk you through. Uh, although sometimes this is the one thing where it's like people who are not, like drawing doesn't come very naturally to you um, are like, can you give us a pattern please? And this is the one area where I kind of understand because normally I'll just teach you to do it yourself. But you can, you, if you can't draw a bat yourself, then this would be a problem. And just like the collar, I sketched in my stitching line for this so that I could stitch exactly where I wanted to. And I'm going to clip my corners and curves again and turn these again right side out. This is just that two layers of black shantung. Once again, the same exact methodology as I did for the collar here for these skirt details that surely anyone else would make into a pocket flap and have a pocket hanging in here. It would again, not be hard. If you are advanced <laughs> and you understand 
how this skirt goes together in the end, you'd be like, wow, it really would be easy to throw a pocket in there, Esposito. And the truth is, yes. But I always have a handbag, especially when I'm wearing a cocktail dress like this. I'm not going anywhere without a handbag. Although when I go out, normally I don't drink because usually I want to drive myself home. And I'm very paranoid about not drinking if I'm going to drive, unless it's going to be like hours and hours and hours apart. <sighs> because I am a uh, safety-minded human who likes to be at home with her cat. Let's Let's be honest. I like to dress for cocktails at the jazz bar, and I like to be at home. So it's a contradiction of my life. What I really need is like cool speakeasies within walking distance of my house. So things to look for in a neighborhood in the future. But I do have to start working on my outer skirt layer as well. So let me transfer all of my darts onto this. Again, this is the same side swept skirt pattern that I used earlier. The only difference is where I put the zipper in the original skirt, I cut away a little bit of each side. I will show you what I mean in this sketch. So this is the original skirt pattern. This is the modified version. So just cut a little bit away where I put the zipper. Instead of having a zipper there, I'm going to have an opening. That opening will be finished with that collar, that bat collar pieces, um, in the same way that I would do a collar. Just a collar for the side of my hip, which makes zero sense. But once again, for the darts on this, I do have this orange fabric layered over the mesh here. And so I do need to go ahead and baste inside my darts again, so those don't move around when I sew these darts on the skirt. And the rest of the outside edge of this is basted. I did that flat on the basement floor. And anytime I crawl around on the basement floor, I am reminded that I am indeed 31 and that I am not flexible or in any sort of shape other than slightly soft. Um, so I just turn into goo and I regret it the next day. So I use some sort of muscles whenever I crawl on the floor to cut things out that I don't know about until the next day when I'm in pain. So that's always nice. So I'll sew these darts here in this overskirt the same way as I sewed the darts for the back of the bodice. We just don't have the cotton interlining this time. I'm just doing these two layers here um, because this overskirt, there's gonna be enough uh, layers going into this waist seam. We don't need another one. And I didn't want it to make this too heavy. Um, and luckily just the mesh and the taffeta alone was plenty enough for a nice drape to the skirt. You'll see, I think the side hangs very nicely in this one, which is nice. I've had more luck with that side swept skirt in polyester actually than I have in silk so far. I have to find the perfect interlining for doing the silk taffeta version as opposed to this poly taffeta. The poly taffeta hangs quite nicely and is of course <laughs> exceptionally cheaper, but not a natural fiber. We all know I do prefer an iridescent silk taffeta, but Really, any iridescent taffet I love, so who am I kidding? But I will press my darts. Um, the little side seam that isn't a side seam on this, I will press towards the back as if it were a dart. Again, see the side swept skirt video for a better explanation of how this overskirt goes together, because it is the same set of steps. And the only other difference is, instead of putting a zipper up here on this left-hand hip side, I'm going to put these weird <laughs> collary pieces. And again, I'm just doing that the same way I did the collar. So I'm pinning the underside of the bat wing to the fashion fabric outside layer of the skirt. And I will stitch that on and I will finish it the same way I did the collar as well. So this again, just gets all the seam allowance gets tucked inside. That edge is finished just like I did the collar and I will slip stitch that shut along here. And then the rest of this side seam for my skirt here just gets sewn to the other side. I would say the front and back, but this is one giant piece. So it's the front and back, but there's no other side seam. Again, see the side skirt video to make sense of this skirt. It's a very large pattern piece. I didn't want to go through drafting it again, just because it's a huge piece of paper and then a huge piece of fabric. So you can see me wrangle that one more in that other video. I'll just run that side seam through the machine here, and then I can go ahead and press that open right here on the ironing board. And honestly, I should have surged this uh, seam beforehand or finished in some way. Um, I end up felling it down to the interlining a little bit uh, down by the hem as well. And then right here, I actually am just going to stitch uh, by hand, kind of whip stitch the very end of this as like invisibly as I can, just to give it a little bit of extra strength right there at that split because it will receive a tiny bit of tension when I, when I go to take the dress off and on. All right, now I have to explain how these skirts both this outer skirt and the inner skirt are going to be sewn on to the bodice. What the layering situation is, here is our waist seam. Here's the dress. Imagine it laying flat with the shoulder seams 
open. This is what it would look like if you had a top-down view of a giant dress. So I need to sew the pencil skirt under layer to the bodice, of course, like so. Um, that is what my zipper is going to go into. If you imagine that little uh, staples area up, that's where my center back zipper is going to be. And then I'm going to layer the overskirt on top of the underskirt uh, off set like this a little bit so that half of the back of the underskirt is just not sewn into the waist seam and that will like flap over and hook shut. So I have my underskirt layer and then sandwiched between the underskirt and the bodice, I need to have my overskirt layer. Hopefully this makes any sense. Once you see like when the zipper goes in, how this looks, I'm going to put a 24 inch dress length zipper down the center back of my dress from the top uh, back neckline to about halfway down the pencil skirt underskirt layer. And then the overskirt is just gonna be hanging free in here for most of the left back left side of my dress. I am going to, however, sew it in along with the waist seam between the bodice and underskirt for the front and then the right hand side of the back. Oh no. Once again, this makes absolutely no sense. Hopefully you can kind of get an idea of what I'm talking about here. And when you see the finished dress and the rest of this construction, you can kind of get an idea of what I mean. But if not, just come back to this drawing and sort of stare at it some more because um, hopefully it'll start to make sense. Uh, I don't know about like hour three. But now that everything is layered together properly, I can go ahead and run this through the machine, this very thick waist seam, which we're really relying on Guterman to make a nice thread here that will hold this buddy together. The nice thing too about tension at the waist seam is you have to remember that when the garment is on your body, your body is supporting a lot of the weight of the garment. So it's more of a problem with like hanger stress than it is with um, the garment receiving a ton of ton of tension because luckily your body helps distribute the weight of the fabric. But this is how that looks after I sewed that seam. So this has a little clip here that again, I'm going to put some hand stitching in just to stabilize that area. And then the rest of this overskirt, I'm going to finish with some, again, double fold bias tape here, um, just to finish this edge because it will not be lined in any way. And it will flap closed over my center back zipper. So the nice thing is for the skirt of this, there will be no visible zipper. There will only be a center back zipper from the like waist up down the back, visually at least. Secretly, there will be a zipper into my underskirt. But after I have that double fold stitched on, I will turn it to the inside like so, iron it into place, and then once again, I will hand stitch this down to the inside. And then I can put my zipper into the center back of my bodice and the underskirt. So I'm just gonna sew from the zipper down to the hem of this pencil skirt under layer. And that just has one inch seam allowance as usual. And I will fold back the rest of the dress here up to the bodice with that same one inch seam allowance. I like to use a wider seam allowance down my center back or anywhere I'm gonna put a zipper basically, just to give myself a little bit more room to work with when doing a zipper. And of course this bodice has the three layers and therefore when folded like this, six layers of fabric. So I didn't worry about interfacing this at all in any way. Um, the skirt is just the one layer of taffeta, which I would worry about, except for it's poly taffeta, which is pretty strong. So I think it'll be okay. Um, with the mini layers, that's why I have so many pins here is because I'm keeping that mesh aligned with the under layers as best I can, because it's not like fused down, it's just basted. So gotta keep it all together somehow. And this uh, right-hand side of my zipper here, the right-hand side of the back of my garment is going to be stitched right next to the zipper teeth. So I'll go ahead and do that side first, and then the other side will be the lapped side of my lapped zipper, like so. So starting at the bottom of the zipper, which is down here in my plain taffeta skirt. Again, just stitching this right close to the edge of my zipper teeth. I can get quite close with the zipper foot, which is nice. I actually really prefer doing zippers on this 99 compared to back when I was doing them on modern machines with like the modern zipper foots. I don't know, this seems easier to me for some reason. I'm such a convert to this machine. If you've never worked with one of these old cast iron singers, uh, you, if you can find one on like Craigslist or a garage sale or at the antique mall, wherever, I highly recommend them. Um, I know I go on and on about it, but it's just really made sewing more uh, enjoyable for me, honestly. Uh, I always say that sewing is kind of my least favorite part of sewing. Like my favorite part are is designing uh, pattern drafting and then styling the end garment and embellishing maybe but like putting things together construction is not my actually favorite part of sewing I enjoy it obviously on some level, but 
of the process, of the entire process. It's not my favorite step, but sewing with a 99, I enjoy it more. And that is that. Now the other side of the zipper, the lapped side, I uh, pinned it down so it was overlapped and then I hand stitched that shut. Again, I will show you how I do a hand stitched zipper in a separate zipper video next year sometime that I can link to from then on because it's uh, kind of hard to film but now that my zipper is in down the center back of this and the top edge of my overskirt is finished with that bias tape, I just need to put a skirt hook here. So instead of a hook and eye, I'm gonna use a big skirt hook. I prefer these. So I just put the bar of the hook onto the waist, like right below the waist seam of my dress. And then I sewed the hook onto the skirt and it will just hook closed here over the zipper. And now all I need to do is hem my dress. So I'm just going to use some, again, double fold bias tape that I made. I was kind of vexed honestly, on how to hem this because I didn't know if I should hem the mesh and the taffeta layers separately, but I had treated them as one thus far everywhere else and it had worked fine. So I am trusting this mesh not to stretch out more than the taffeta does or vice versa and hoping everything will be okay. You know, disastrously, if something were to happen and one would stretch a lot more than the other, over time I could always re-hem the dress, which would take a while because this is a big hem, but would be worth it. Um, but so far, Fingers crossed, everything seems to be holding up okay. So I just have double fold bias tape made out of the same shantung that the collar and flangey bits are made out of. And I'm just stitching that right sides together on the outside of my skirt here. I do have a video showing how I hem with bias here on the channel, it's kind of an old video and I'm out of cards so I can't link it to you. But if you search the word hemming on my channel, I'm sure it will come up um, because I like, anytime I use a curved hem, my preferred method of hemming it is with bias tape. So I'm just gonna turn all that bias to the inside here pin that into place. This shot is not in focus and it's not even framed very nicely either, but hopefully you get an idea of what I'm doing. But I will hand stitch this hem, just the edge of the bias down to the orange interlining of this skirt. And then this dress will be finished and ready to wear, which seems unbelievable, honestly. It was a few extra steps with all the basting, but all in all, this pattern actually isn't too difficult to put together. I just think I made it harder on myself by using that mesh. But of course, the whole reason I was making the dress was because of the excellent mesh. And I think you will agree it's definitely worth a couple extra hours in the making to have a sparkly spiderweb dress. Here is my finished Halloween inspired cocktail dress with taffeta and shantung and mesh and all fancy fabrics, even if they are polyester, all the fancy fabrics that are of course also washable, which is useful in case you spill some Halloween punch down the front of your dress. Not that I would ever do such a thing because I of course am full of poise and elegance at all times. And we can just hope that I do end up having a bunch of friends in order to have people over for cocktails uh, or dinner parties or Halloween parties, etc. because I do have quite a few outfits for such occasions and less occasions. But you know, the future is unknowable and maybe there will be plenty of partying for me to be doing. I hope you enjoyed seeing how this design came together today and happy Halloween to all of you out there who are as pleased as I am that it is the end of October, the height of spooky season, and I may have a few more treats coming to the channel for you here real soon. And thank you as always for watching today. I'll be back with more sewing, vintage fashion, costuming, and crafting real soon. So I'll see you then. Bye.